Lee Waters is with us, and he's one of our own. Lee, if you want to come on up, we'd just like for you to uh, take it away and uh, give us your thoughts, because sure. this is probably more important this year than, than we've ever had before. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Before I get started, um, just want to make a special thank you to Beth Bolger and Amy Hayes for getting this room arranged. This has been a pretty good venue for us the last couple of years, so you know, we got plenty of room. And then also our crop insurance service division, especially uh, Beth Niles, for helping put this presentation together. Um, I'm fairly tech savvy, but not this tech savvy to put something like this together, so it uh, should be a good one. So start off with this. Um, farmer is uh, working his field in the spring and comes across the end row, notices something laying in the field and reaches down and picks up a, a lamp. When he runs his hand across it, a genie comes out. Amazed, the farmer looks at this genie, and the genie looks at his farmer and says, Master, you have three wishes to be granted. And he thinks about it for a minute, and then he goes, I wish for six fifty corn and $15 soybeans. The genie says, wish is granted. The farmer takes the lamp, puts it back in the back of his pickup truck, goes about the summer, actually gets in the fall, gets his combine out, kind of thinking about it, and sees that lamp sitting in his truck, pulls it back out. Genie pops out and goes, Master, you have two more wishes still. What would you like to be granted? Farmer thanks for a minute. He goes, I wish for six fifty corn and $15 beans. Master, Genie goes, well, Master, that's what you wished for last time. And Farmer goes, well, this time I'm actually going to sell it at that. So <laughs> we've all been through this before, me included. Um, one thing, right before we get started, what's driving home about your crop insurance policy, your individual policy gives you a bushel guarantee. And I'm not saying I'm going to be the expert who tells you how to sell your grain, but your policy gives you the flexibility to sell grain up to a level that you're guaranteed. This farmer right here, for instance, is guaranteed 75,000 bushels. So say he sees an opportunity between, excuse me, between now and harvest and wants to make a sale, it's like a ticker. You know, say he makes a 1,000 bushel sale, 5,000 bushel sale, so on and so forth. The point of this is just saying it gives you the opportunity to make take advantage of opportunities that come about. And like this summer was a perfect example of that. We had the, the uh, invasion of Ukraine, had a run up in price. Whether we are making those sales or not is up to us, but at the end of the day, we had those opportunities. We were also gifted it again this fall with some good prices, which was good. Very good year for everybody um, in general. Very surprised at yields. I think everybody can say that too. We were probably a couple rains away in central Illinois, especially Champaign County from having a pretty poor crop and we're able to save that. So, so say you had two of those more wishes, what are some things we would be thinking of? I can rattle off a bunch of them here, but here's a few, obviously. Sometimes we're blessed with these, sometimes we're not. But one thing I could say is there is something that you can purchase to at least protect against some of that, which is crop insurance. So we're gonna go through a few things. There's a few changes this year. Nothing big, but some interesting stuff, and just kind of driving home that there's a lot of flexibility within your policy and some things you can add to it to really give you some protection. Um, first big change this year is the uh, soybean plant date change. So for a long time, especially in the four counties here that I work primarily, um, Champaign, Vermilion in particular, the soybean planting date, the initial planting date was April 20th. All that meant was is if you planted before that, you didn't have replant coverage. There are additional endorsements available, and they still are to back that date up, but on your federal crop policy, that was the date. Major change this year is that has now been moved to April 10th. I felt this is very important. Um, so, oh, sorry, early soybean planting has become more common. Um, this does give us the uh, opportunity that we're not having to worry about that 20th date now, um, but early plant date riders are still available, but that is a big change, big change for 2023. Um, for those of you in the southern part, everybody in the Greene County part of this state was April 15th before, and that is now April 5th. So uh, one quick note, June 20th on the bottom here is still the final plant date to plant beans. All that means is if you plant after June 20th, you're losing 1% of coverage per day on your policy till July 15th. So once you get past June 20th, if you've not been able to plant, that is when the prevent plant discussion may come about. So just to kind of review corn, corn hasn't changed. Um, I can argue sometimes maybe the early plant date's too early for corn sometimes. But early April 5th is the, is the first date and June 5th is the final. 2019, we ran into this with corn with uh, getting bumped up to that June 5th date. So when we talk about preventive planting, that's if we've been prevented from planting due to weather 
up to that date, we have the choice to take that or not. So plant dates have been covered. Leaves really good topic of replant. <clears throat> so your multi-peril policy does include replant coverage. It covers up to 20, you have to be a 20 acre minimum for your federal crop policy. And depending on the spring price, usually like last year it ranged around 40 to $45. What I will drive home with everybody is just, if you are even debating on replanting your crop, whether it's one acre or a thousand acres, call your agent, put in a claim first. Even if it's gotta be withdrawn, I'd rather have the claim in if you're considering replanting because we wanna have that covered. There's a, a self-certification rule. If it's under 100 acres per farm, adjuster's just gonna talk to you on the phone and I'll have to look at it. If it's more than that, obviously they're gonna wanna take a quick picture, give you the go ahead. So that's the thing. If you don't put the claim in before, it's very difficult to get that paid. So um, just to recall too, there are additional replant endorsements. I'm a huge proponent of these. About every company out there offers some type of rider you can purchase in lieu of adding additional replant coverage. Most of them, the big difference between these and the multi peril policies is they typically cover an acre one instead of acre 20. Many of them pay roughly between 50 and $75 an acre additional on top of the, of the federal crop policy. Um, most of them include an early rider. So for instance, like last year, I have one that would back you up, you know, between 12 and 20 days, depending on the policy. So for instance, this year now, in April 10th, bean day, most of your riders are gonna get you into March. I'm not proponing planting beans in March, but let's say that first week of April is beautiful. Um, if I'm gonna plant something where I'm a little concerned about the weather later, it's gonna be soybeans before it's corn. So it gives you that flexibility. Um, many of the companies too also offer to ensure the 100% of the crop, where this is big is if you have an 80, that's 50-50 with your mother or something. Your federal crop covers you on your share only. A lot of, some of these riders, will cover you and the landlords to yourself. So that's also a big deal. My main home thing to drive with replant riders is this. Um, I'm not saying the seed's expensive. Most of the time you're gonna get free seed for it. But I'm gonna make a lot easier decision to tear up an 80 of corn if I'm getting $75 and $45 together, you know, 120 and change versus 45 bucks. So, and I always say this, if you're soybeans, and this is more of an agronomic talk, but if you think you gotta replant beans, you probably need to give them a little time. If you think you gotta replant corn, you probably gotta replant corn. So just as I said, riders give you more flexibility and some more money to come towards that to maybe offset some later yield loss in case if it's a late planting. Um, real quick review of PACE. PACE came out in 2022. Last year as a pilot policy in central Illinois. Basically what this is, is a side dressing protection program. I'm gonna walk through the details in a minute. Big change for this year is available in the entire state. In a nutshell, what PACE is, this is an endorsement you buy on top of your federal crop policy. It basically does this. If you're an able of side dressing nitrogen between V3 and V10, and this is determined by a number of factors, plant date, growing degree days, if, if a claim's put in, an adjuster is calculating all this. If you're prevented due to rain, not I couldn't get my ammonia, my tractors broke down. This is basically the same type of rules that maybe applies to preventive planting. It's due to weather. You have a policy that can pay you a loss on that accordingly. The, the amount of premium you pay and the amount of coverage you get is determined by how much percentage of side dressing nitrogen you are versus your pre-plant. So like I have a quote that maybe has a guy putting on 30% of his end side dress, which maybe it's 60 pounds. Maybe you're doing 100 pounds. Maybe you're doing 150 pounds. The more your side dressing later, the more this costs. What it does is it's basically a band of coverage that will give you a certain amount of bushels. So like a 30% person may get you know, 60 bucks, 10 bushels, the bigger one gets more. But this is what you drive home with this product. It's gonna range from four to $20 an acre depending on how much you side dress. But if you do collect on this product, if you are prevented from side dressing in that window, you are not allowed to rescue treat it after the fact. So I always want to tell people, if you're going to be somebody who's going to say, I am going to get my nitrogen on, I'm going to fly it on if I have to, this may not be something you want to purchase. If you're one that's going to be willing to walk away and see what happens, collect this and see what the federal crop does, it could be something to look at too. So I just want to make sure everybody knows that and go from there with it. So um, next thing to cover is crop hail insurance. So obviously most of my clients and a lot of you out here probably have a multi-parallel policy and a crop hail policy. Huge proponent of crop hail. 
One big thing about crop hail is it works separately from your multi parallel So many of you probably have what's, you know, with federal crop, so let's say you take enterprise units, you have 1,000 acres of corn, one field does poorly, rest do well, may or may not have a claim. Crop hail does go down to the field level. So uh, many of you are enterprise units, I like especially having a crop hail policy. You buy it in levels of $100 per acre of coverage. So like, for instance, maybe last year, if you had $1,000 on corn and the rate was 40 cents 100, that's four bucks an acre. Let's say you did $800 on beans, it was a dollar 100. Eight times a dollar, eight bucks an acre. So a uh, big thing about crop hail is not just hail. It does protect many other things. Um, stored grain rider, so if you have a bin that bursts open or catches fire, things like that, your hail covers, uh, covers for that. Not spoiled grain, I've been asked that a thousand times, but for, you know, from natural perils. Fire is a huge one. If your own combine catches your field on fire, hail is your only coverage. Your farm liability does not cover your own combine catching your field on fire. Now, if neighbor's combine catches your field on fire, neighbor's liability insurance comes into play sometimes, and so does hail, and they work together on it. Um, had a couple examples of this this last year. So there's something to keep in mind, grain in transit, if you pull out a field, roll your truck, grain spills into, say, a drainage ditch or something crazy like that, Grain you can't recover, plus the cleanup cost is part of your hail insurance. Vandalism, some kid drives through your cornfield, takes out a couple acres of corn, probably did more damage to his car than he did to your field, but hail insurance comes in that play too. You gotta have a, you put in a, a police report for it, but I've had a lot of those over the years also. So just uh, keep in mind, crop hail is a very valuable, fairly inexpensive product that you can put in conjunction with your policy. You do have the ability to add endorsements most popular ones are wind, green snap, and extra harvest expense. Um, mainly what I'll say about these is this. If you suspect you have wind damage, and we'll go through what the perils are in a moment, just the same thing with everything else. Contact the agent, put the claim in if you feel necessary so we can get going on it. Uh, the main thing with this is there are basically three components. Green snap, we're going to show you visual in a minute, is when you break the plant off below the ear. Wind is down corn, they're paying for what the ears you cannot gather up. If the corn's down and you're getting it, that's not wind damage, it's what's left behind the combine. Extra harvest expense is down corn, and this is a vague statement, there's specific rules with the angles and how much it's knocked down, but extra harvest expense is down corn. You're combining it slower than normal because it's down, they're paying you typically 8% times your liability, so a $1,000 person would get 80 bucks an acre, for dealing with that down corn, basically. It has to have 20 acres minimum or 20% of the field to qualify, so if you have an end row of down corn, that's not part of it. If you have a whole field flat, typically of the three things, EHE, extra harvest expense, is typically one that pays most often, depending on the situation. So if you're gonna buy wind, you want all three products. So, um, just to kind of review again, almost all wind policies have a deductible. I'm a fan of no deductible on your hail policy. But on your wind, most companies have some type of deductible. The most common are 5% flat, which means you have to have 5% on the ground or snapped off to start paying. 5% disappearing means you got to get to 5% to start paying, and once you exceed a certain level, sometimes it's 25%, it disappears. There's 10% disappearing deductibles. There's one company that has a 0% deductible. Premium varies by those deductibles. So. Um, big thing here too, um, is what I want to go over is some additional coverage options and different things this year too. Um, next topic, SCO and ECO, supplemental coverage option and enhanced coverage option. What these two are, these are two plans that can be added to your multi parallel policy you have existing. They're both subsidized products. And what they do is they use county-based numbers on top of your multi parallel policy to trigger losses or not. What SCO does, SCO takes you from 86% down to the level you're purchasing, and that band is based on county yields and, and, and market or spring and fall prices, so on and so forth. So what many may do is if they buy an 80, if they add SCO to it, I'll show a visual in a minute, 86 to 80 is county, 
then 80 down is you. One strategy of this is maybe that 85 is more expensive than 80 with SCO. It all depends on what your risk appetite is. Advantage, maybe a little cheaper. Disadvantage, county does better than you do. It's things to think about when you're buying these products. The main thing to drill home with this is if you want to buy SCO, you have to have at the Farm Service Agency your crop enrolled in PLC. And we'll go through that in a little bit. So remember, SCO equals PLC, not our county. The other product is enhanced coverage option. All ECO is is think SCO, but it goes up to 95%. You can buy 90 or 95%, ignore the 90. If you're gonna buy it, you buy 95, you don't buy 90. All it does is from 95 to 86 is based on county yields also. Of all the plans out there that you can purchase that get you above 85%, these are the only two that have the same exact workings as your federal crop with spring, fall price, harvest price options, so on and so forth, and they're subsidized. There's a lot of other individual products out there privately you can purchase also. Um, won't, I'll probably just briefly cover that at the end, but uh, these are probably, the, for value, probably the best ones. So you do not have to be in PLC to buy ECO, just SCO. This kind of gives you a little visual how it works. First set of grain here is your revenue protection policy. For everybody in the United States, it's 50 to 85%. Enterprise, optional, we'll go through that in a little bit. But that band right there is you, your farm, your APH, your yields. SCO, 86 down to what you buy. If you have 85, it's 1%, I wouldn't mess with it. Just my personal opinion, I'm not gonna have an extra thing for 1%. But if you're 80 or less, SCO is something you need to look at, in my opinion. ECO just goes on up to the top, 90 or 95 percent. What you're basically doing with these is you're starting to shrink your deductible down. Deductible is what's not covered, obviously. So that's a visual. You can even take ECO without SCO. So you can have a spot in the middle if you like. So like this person may have took an RP80, just skipped on over and went on up to ECO if they wanted to. This is a very common one I have is where I have somebody takes 80 and then takes 6% SCO with DLC. Very common product. So lots of different options. This may be more popular south where we have higher rates. They may, you know, 75 in southern Illinois is like what our 8085 cost up here. If they're wanting to buy up, it's even more expensive for them to jump higher. They might look at SCO in their county. But it, it can maybe, if you're on the, say you're in a county that has a lot of floodplain ground, if you're up on the hills, this may be a good one to look at. If you're in the flood prey ground, you may not. So just to kind of give you a quick review of these. At the end of the day, just remember, ECO, SCO uses county yields, RMA-based. And what happens is, is once everybody turns in their yields in the, in the state of Illinois or your county or whatever, the following June is when they determine the final county yield. And that's how they calculate the loss. So just tying this into the FSA programs. If anybody from Champaign County FSA is here, I don't wanna be mean, but they want you to get this done quickly. You have till March 15th to pick your farm program. The only thing that's really determining between these two at the end of the day is if you're 80 or less and you wanna buy SCO, you need to take PLC. If you're 85, you're probably not gonna do SCO, pick one. Neither of them are gonna pay in 2023, and this is why. PLC is a price floor program. If the national average price, which is basically what everybody in the United States sells corn for in 23 for a marketing year average, is less than 370, then you would have a PLC payment. If that happens, we're in, we're in trouble this year. Now, we had some of these payments in 2015, 2016. We had a lot of 350-ish type numbers. That's what, how that program works. Beans is 840. Our county, Kind of feels like crop insurance. What it's doing, it's taking a five-year Olympic average of yield, five-year Olympic average of price, multiply them together times 86%. Kind of sounds like SCO a little bit. Gives you a revenue guarantee. If your county yield and the national marketing year average is less than the revenue guarantee our county pays. So what I'll tell you is this. Our county, same problem that it has, is the marketing year average price it's got, it's using is been drugged down by prior years, so it's in the fours. So for instance, Champaign County has a 
$762 trigger to calculate a loss. So like if we're at six dollar corn, you gotta be like in the low hundreds for a county to have a loss on our county. So what I tell people is if you're 80 or less, SCO, even though you gotta buy it, coupled with PLC, has a massive head start on revenue guarantee versus our county. But if you're not buying SCO, probably lean our county, but don't plan on either from paying. That's, my, that's basically my spiel on FSA. Another new thing this year, and it's not necessarily new, it's just a little change, is the new ability to have a blanket written agreement on what's called falling in other crop soybeans. Many of you call that double crop soybeans. So if you have wheat acres in Champaign County for years past, they were not insurable. They could technically be insured if you did a written agreement. All written agreement is is talking to RMA and saying, hey, I've been planting double crop beans a while and here's my yields. Could I get a rate given to me to insure these? Sometimes they do it, sometimes they've not. Now what's big is you can do what's called a blanket written agreement, which means I've never had double crop soybeans and I'm going to now and I want to insure them. What's the, they're going to give you a rate you have to request. I don't know the rate yet. It'll probably be higher than normal beans. But one thing I want to make clear in this room with this, this really affects, and it's kind of hard to see here, but see the counties basically above I-70 that are hashed. These are the ones that were not able to do it before. Everybody south of I-70 has been able to insure double crops for a long time. So in the south, you have the ability to separate your double crop beans in one pile of insurance versus your regular ones. So that if your double crops are bad and your others are good, they're looked at separately. Up here for 2023, if you do a blanket written agreement and insure your double crops and your enterprise units, they are going to be lumped in. So if you have an 80 of beans that's double crop and then you have 1,000 acres of normal beans, and let's say those normal beans make 70 and the double crops make 10, in an enterprise unit, they are going to look at the whole picture. You cannot separate it. That may get changed in the future, but for this year, that is the case. So if you're optional units, something to think about, or if you maybe have somebody else farming the wheat and the soybeans, something to think about, but keep that in mind. My recommendation, if you're enterprise units, you're probably not gonna wanna insure them, but if you're optional, you might. So it'll be a case-by-case -case basis. So keep that in mind when we're talking about this year. Um, new thing this year for us, and this will apply to a few people in the room, is uh, livestock insurance. Livestock insurance has kind of been around for a while, not been real attractive in central Illinois, but there's a new product. It's been around for a few years, but we're starting to get some more traction in our company called LRP, Livestock Revenue Protection. Um, all livestock revenue protection is, is basically the ability to buy a subsidized put against cattle. And then what happens is if the price goes down later, it's got a floor, has a coverage level, it pays you X when you unwind that position. You're able to buy these positions and allotments. So basically what this might do is, let's say you use the board that when you buy cattle, you hedge it on the board of trade and blocks. This is basically a way that you could maybe do that using a subsidized product. The way this is gonna be handled in our office is we're gonna have one person that's gonna handle this. So I have, some, I have a couple people have already looked at it. Um, we have one gentleman named John Stroll out of Effingham, actually from Siegel, Illinois, have a lot of livestock experience. He's going to be our lead on livestock revenue protection. All it means is if you're going to buy this product, what you're basically doing is you're going to commit to him for a year that if you do make a position, you're with this agent. You may sign a policy with us and do this, and you may never use it. If you don't use it, it doesn't cost you anything. What John's going to do is if you do have interest, Basically, it's almost like dealing with a broker. He may contact you as much as you want, as needed. Say, hey, here's the prices, here's the premiums right now. Would you like to make a position or not? Or you may be a farmer who buys 1,000 head of cattle and wants to make, take a position on that. So John's very good. Um, the reason we're doing this is I think it's good to have specialists in this, and he's going to be a good specialist for it. So if anybody's got interest, just reach out to us. So premiums. So we're talking about premiums for 23. I've started thinking about this in September for next year. Last year was probably one of the biggest uptick in premiums we've seen, probably since 2012, 2008. Um, last year we also had one of the highest spring prices we've seen in a long time too, and we insured a lot of dollars. But just gonna take a moment to kind of walk through what drives your cost of crop insurance. 
First one is APH, actual production history. This is the history on your farm of all your yields. Um, the higher your APH is, the more dollars and bushels per acre you can guarantee. All APHs are different. So all farms cost a little different. Basically, at the end of the day, there are endorsements that help that APH maybe be higher or lower depending on the age of it. So the two endorsements I'll focus on, one is TA. Trend, there's a lot of acronyms in crop insurance, if you haven't noticed, and it's getting worse every year. I've done this 16 years, and I think there's 20 more endorsements now than there used to be. But trend adjustment's big. All, all TA does is it looks at the age of your database. Let's say you have a 10-year-old database. And it goes over to the right, and every year you have a crop, the older that year is, the bigger boost it gets. Like a one-year-old yield gets a two-bushel jump, and a 10-year-old yield may get a 20-bushel jump. There's a factor built in. So depending on the age of your history, the more TA is doing for you, the more it may cost. So for instance, if you have an 80 that rotates, you may have a 20-year-old history. TA is giving you a big jump in yield. You pay a little more for it. The other major one is yield exclusion, YE. YE came out a couple years after 2012. In Champaign, Ford, Vermilion, doesn't apply to Pyatt and Douglas. Um, this allows you to exclude the 2012 year out of your history completely. Also pay for that. One big thing this year, for those of you who have 10 straight crop years, is 12 is getting ready to fall off your database. So what's gonna happen with a lot of APHs this year? At the end of the day, the, the beginning yield, let's say your original APH is 210, and then after you apply all your endorsements, it's 230. The spread between those is basically the driver of how much that unit costs. What's gonna happen to a lot of people that have 12 falling off is the original yield's gonna jump and the final yield isn't gonna move much. That may sound like, well, I didn't really get a jump in history. What's happened is, is now you may have a 220 APH with a 230 approved yield. With having a little less spread going on, those letters are doing less, it costs less. Of course, print, we're going to get to more premium drivers in a minute, but that's going to be a pretty unique thing. So when you quote, and when we quote, like to get your updated APH as possible. Some of those farms have 12 fallen off. We may have a little bit different picture this year of your premium. So something else big about it. Um, unit structure, mainly in my area, enterprise units, basic units, optional units. I'll go through these in a minute, but just think enterprise units is all together. Even if you keep track of your farm separate, when we work a claim in enterprise units, we look at the positives and the negatives of every field and, and we net it out. So if one farm has a $10,000 loss, one farm exceeded guarantee by 10,000, we put the net difference together. Optional units, OU, looks at every farm separately. So if you have a $10,000 loss here and a 10,000 gain, we're only looking at the losses. Basic units is if you have one field and it goes by share. So like say you got, your grandma has an 80, she probably has a basic unit policy. Couple unique things, multi-county enterprise units. What that does is if you have 1,000 acres in Champaign County and you got an 80 across the county line in Vermilion, you have a couple options. You can either put that 80 in basic units and insure it on its own at a little higher rate, or you can tie it into Champaign County as a multi-county enterprise unit and they look at it with it. You pay less of a rate for it, you get the enterprise unit rate on it, but it does get tied in. So that's when you're doing that, you need, it needs to be a contiguous means touching. So I can't like have a, 80 in Cook County and 1,000 acres here and tie it in. But if it's next door, you can. Think about, when you do that though, think about what the farm's like in the side county. If it's on a rough piece, you might want to leave it separate. If it's just like your other farms, you may want to put it together. Um, EI is one that applies here. That's, ir that's enterprise by irrigation practice. It, that's been new for about four years. If you have pivots, highly recommend keep your irrigated on a separate database, then you're not irrigated because a lot of the times your irrigated may out yield, you're not irrigated in a dry year. So you can have all your enterprise unit uh, non irrigated in one pile, and say you got four pivots, you want to put the irrigated in a different coverage. Some people may take a lower coverage on the irrigated versus non irrigated. You have options. So take a bit, it doesn't cost you anything to do that typically. Always recommend having those separate. Enterprise by C, that's cropping practice, which we cannot do up here. That's what that allows down south to do double crop beans separate. We hope in the future, if we continue this, we'll be able to do that. Coverage level, obviously, 50 to 85%, but don't always remember ECO, SCO also. So a lot of that's determined by that. The higher coverage you buy, the more it costs, but there's a lot of ways to put coverages together. 
with my customers this year, I, I put it in three tiers. There's the first tier is 10 to 20 bucks an acre. Second tier is going to be 20 to 40 bucks. The big tier is going to be 40 to 70 bucks. You can put a lot of combinations within those tiers. There's a lot of ways to structure your policy, but there's about 12 ways that really make sense for this group in this, in this area. So you may have an NF85 optional guy spending $60, and he may look and go, well, you know, I can buy 80 enterprise with SCO and maybe ECO for similar money. So what it comes down to choosing coverage, really it's two things. Am I optional or enterprise? If you want your field separate, you go that route and you look at the optional rates. If you, if you want them together, that's when you look at the other products. You know, do I add a county product? Do I not? It gives you a lot of different flexibility. And finally, market volatility. Of all things that really drive premium is option volatility. So when we quote, you know, we always, well, we got to see what the spring price is. And that's part of it. You know, right now I'm, I'm using 6 and 1380. It's going to be what it is. Um, if we have uh, 570 or 620 in the spring, the rate's not going to change a whole lot. I mean, it will a little bit. The more dollars you insure, the more you pay. And that's what we hope for. High. We hope 650 shows up. The big one is volatility of options. So we have what's called a, a volatility factor that's plugged into your quote. That is driven by option volatility. So back in September, I'm looking at 23, and I'm using the volatility then, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, we're gonna see a 20% increase in rates for 23. Here we go. Right now, the volatility's dropped a bunch. So actually, today, I'm actually using a little lower volatility than I did last year. What I'll tell you from my gut is this, if you're trying to make a budget right now, whatever you paid last year is probably gonna be very similar to what you paid this year, with maybe a 10, maybe 15% swing one way or the other. Sounds like a lot, but if you spent 40, you're gonna be between 35 and 45 bucks if you don't change anything. If it's 45 bucks, you probably got a six in front of your spring price. If it's 35 bucks, you probably got five in front of it. So if you have a six in front of it, that's a good thing. So just keep that in mind. Um, I always say, you know, get in that range where you wanna be, be in that tier, get, get how you wanna figure it out and let it go and you can always change it. Say you sign up for coverage today, and it gets to be March 15th, and we have $8 corn for some reason, and premiums doubled, we can change that still. You, you can change it in limited times until March 15th. Same with the FSA program. If you signed up for ARC County or whatever you did, let's say you signed up for ARC and you're like, oh man, I want to do SCO and I screwed up. You can change it. Contact FSA, I'll help you with it. I've got a very good relationship with my FSA office people. They're more than willing to just rerun the contract, have you sign it, it's not a big deal. That way you can get it all dialed in the way you want. So we've went through a few of these things, a lot of these wishes. Um, your strong business partner, which is us, hopefully. We want to be your agent. We, I, I think at our company, we take a lot of pride in helping our clients make their best decisions that will help them financially and business-wise. Uh, whatever we can do, I, I, we all enjoy what we're doing really take a lot of pride in, this, in the crop insurance. We want to do the best we can. Just remember when you're doing your renewal, and you are like, why do you always ask if I'm divorced or married every year, Lee? I've been married forever. We need to know all this stuff before renewal season. If you have a marital status change, if you've created a different entity, if your tax ID number is wrong, so on and so forth, the policy must match how you're selling your grain. And I recommend FSA needs to be the same if possible. Um, it doesn't have to be, but if there's farm program payments that kind of tie together, WIP plus, ERP, some of those are tied, probably want to have them match up the best you can. If you're married, though, if you're, a spouse, if you're an individual that's married, spouse must be listed on the policy. Um, you know, if you're in a county south, I don't have any high risk in Champaign, but let's say you farm down south and you, you add an 80, and you never had high risk ground before, and you add an 80 that is high risk, your agent needs to know that because that rate's going to be probably 10 times what the normal rate was. We're just blessed in Champaign County that we don't have to deal with that. But it does change your, your picture of how you're going to insure that. Beginning farmer ranchers, if you farm less than five crop years, you qualify for this. What this basically means is you're going to get a 10% increase in your subsidy rate. So like when you buy 80% enterprise units, I think the, out of the premium, you're paying 40% of it and the government's paying 60% of it. So that would move to 
So that's if you got younger farmers, or if you maybe you have a, a gentleman who inherited an 80 and who's going to 50-50 and never had ground before, they qualify for the same thing. Also qualifies for veterans too. Um, you know, when we send, when you give us our yields and we bring your APH out to you, we send the mail. It doesn't hurt to take a quick look at it. Um, I don't expect you to memorize or really understand everything, but just make sure like you don't see like a hundred bushel of corn where it should have said 220. You know, it's not bad. Sometimes errors happen. Take a quick look at your most recent year. Um, main thing too is when we're coming in, talk to us. Know your break-even costs. Doesn't have to be exact, but back to that first slide with that 75,000 bushels. You know, if you know your break-even costs and you have opportunities to sell, whether you want to sell the whole kit and caboodle or do 1,000 bushels, if you know where you're at, marketing plans can be very simple. Some people do them by like, when I hit a certain level price I sell, some people may do it by time, some people may wing it, but if you're above your break-even costs, that's a good thing, makes you profitable. And then of course, knowing how much you plan to forward market. Also, before we wrap up here, um, many, of us, many of you have reported some production, some of you haven't. April 29th is the deadline to report last year's yields to us. Um, just remember when you're reporting AP, your yields to us, there's two categories of records, soft and hard records. Soft records basically are something that's not from the elevator. So if you uh, have a auger cart weigh scale system that has, okay, this is how many pounds of corn and I convert it to bushels, or you have a notepad that says, oh, I had 12 truckloads of corn going to bin, that's roughly 12,000 bushels, or you use your yield monitor, those are all acceptable soft records, okay? You can report your, your yields to me using these soft records, as long as you just keep it consistent and keep the records. So if you've got a notepad with ticks on it, put it in your safe along with the rest of the stuff, because if we ever need it, it's gonna be needed to check against. A hard record is basically official. It's been delivered to an elevator, an adjuster came out, measured the bin, came up with the bushels. Some of you report your yields to me like that because you took it all to town. But so, let's say you took uh, eight fields all under one name and delivered it all and didn't keep it separate, but you did on your auger wagon. You can use the auger wagon records to report it by field, and if there's a loss, the adjuster's going to take the official auger, or the official elevator records, then they're gonna take the auger wagon to prorate accordingly and pay you. So, you're not penalized if the soft record doesn't exactly match. They're gonna, it's, what happens is, if you're ever, say, an audit, if you're, what you reported to me directly doesn't match what you came off of is when there's a problem. So if you report bushels, make sure we know what kind of record you used, Usually it's a bin measurement, usually it's an auger wagon cart, yield monitor, so on and so forth. Just make sure we know that and keep what you used. So, before we wrap up, got a lot of agents in farm credit. Obviously we, farm, we cover primarily these counties. Uh, combined 230 years of insurance, I'm 16 years of that, I guess I'm 7% of the experience now, I feel like I'm one of the veterans. But uh, 33 of us are on here full time. Um, we all have our territories, um, but it's a great group. We have a, uh, you know, we're a centralized system. So like when I'm sitting with you doing your uh, production report and you see me type it up and send it off, it's going to our crop insurance service division. Great group of people we got that takes that, gets it put in the system, gets stuff mailed out to you, makes us efficient, maybe able to spend more time with you all talking about stuff. Um, it's a good team, great team. Um, also we're cooperative. I don't do the loan side, obviously. Main thing I'll tell you is the, the profits we make from insurance, premiums, commissions, helps farm credit as a whole keep costs down. Not individually, obviously, but the more insurance we book, the more commission we make as a company, keeps our operating costs better. We can provide lower, possibly lower rates to everybody. The big one, obviously, is ca uh, uh, patronage. You know, some of you have loans here, have gotten some patronage checks based on your insurance on your uh, on your loans you have. A lot of this basically do that we've made pretty good money. We're able to contribute some of that back to you. So, you know, if we the more insurance we have, that's just part of the slice of pie that helps with the profitability of this company. And it helps with this with the service of your farm too. Um, we have four solid approved insurance providers we write with with our company. Uh, Rural Community Insurance Services, RCIS, Great American AgriSampo and Crop Risk Services. I believe we have reps from all of them here. Some of you probably know them. I see some adjusters sitting here in the room. 
fantastic companies. Um, we're limited on who we can do business with as a company. They have, these, these companies have to have some certain qualifications financially. I will tell you these, these four do, and they're great companies to deal with. So that's what I got. Um, does anybody got any questions? I don't know if we're a little late on time. All right. All right, well, come find me if you've got questions. Thank you.